Hello and welcome. It's Alexa Linton here, your host for the Whole Horse Podcast. We're here to look at all the ways that the horse industry is changing before our very eyes in very cool, very amazing ways. And we're chatting with the people at the forefront of that change, the professionals, the trainers, the body workers, the researchers that are helping our lives with horses become better and better. Thanks for being here. I love that you're here and listening and learning. And if you ever have a guest that you want to suggest or a topic that you want to hear, just let me know and I'd love to hear from you. Thanks for listening. It means a lot. And I look forward to seeing you for season four. Hi, everyone. It's Alexa Linton here, and you're here for season four of the Whole Horse Podcast. And I'm back today with a very special guest. I'm joined by Julia Alexander, and I, I found Julia through an article shared on Facebook um, called What Horses Can Teach Us About Systemic Oppression, and I knew that I needed to reach out to her and speak with her, and I'm so glad you're here with us today, Julia. Thank you for joining. Well, thank you so much. I feel very humbled and honored to be invited, and I'm excited to talk with you. Mm, yes, me as well. This is a topic that is uh, on this podcast and in my life um, has become more and more uh, brought to the forefront. Um, I feel like I'm in this process of like my eyes, you know, opening wider and wider to to, to things that I um you know, maybe had been taught not to see or uh, had had looked away from. And and when I read your article, I was like, oh my goodness, this this girl, this woman speaks the same language um, of what I'm learning about and and shares it so eloquently. Mm-hmm. And I was very, very moved by by the some of the, the the parallels you were drawing and some of the pieces that you were bringing to the surface. And I, so I would love for you, Julia, to just share a little bit, because I'm sure for a lot of my, my listeners, you're new to them, um, just about your your background, kind of how you came to this, this space um, and the work that you're doing right now. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I, I, I want to just name that I think it's uh, courageous for you to have the conversation. I think, you know, it's, it's a parallel process in, in learning how to be better for our horses and learning how to be better for each other. And there's that same wake up that I think happens and, and having compassion for ourselves through that process is really important. Um, so me, um, gosh, my journey has been, uh, uh, definitely not linear. <laughs> um, so I am a lifelong horse lover person. Um, I started riding when, gosh, I was five or six. And um, I would have to double check with my mom, but I'm pretty sure this was a, you know, dad and I are getting divorced. And, um, you know, here's this thing that you have wanted to do for a long time. Um, so here you go. <laughs> um, so yeah, that was the start of a lifetime of, of loving and being with horses. So, um, my, uh, horse kind of involvement was really, um, informal. Like I was just, um, you know, a barn in Michigan where my, my teacher would, you know, have me ride with my eyes closed and without stirrups and jump over fences. And, you know, we were doing all sorts of, of, crazy things that I probably would not do now. Um, but it wasn't until I think I got a little bit older that, um, I really started to have some internal conflict about kind of what was happening at the barn. And there has been quite a bit of shame for me that, that, that didn't happen sooner. You know, that like, aha I know that shame. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. And I feel like it's really important to name it shame. Um, Shame loves uh, to not be named, right? Shame loves to kind of fester in the dark. <laughs> so um, I try to be really intentional about naming it. Um, so yeah, I uh, I think that there was a lot of cognitive dissonance um, 
And I remember, um, so I, I, I went to undergrad and wanting to study racism. That was kind of like why I went. Um, but I had no idea what that meant. And, you know, race and racism was, was always about somebody else. It wasn't about me in the beginning. <laughs> um, and that was kind of what um, the system had taught me, the system that I grew up in had taught me that, uh, that I wasn't a raced person being a white person, that I was, I was quote unquote normal, um, which is so damaging for everybody, right. To grow up with this, this, um, this perception. Um, so, you know, long story short, I, I ended up in, um, a class called psychology of racism, um, that had been developed by Dr. Beverly Tatum, who, if you haven't read her work, um, she was one of my, and still is one of my all time heroes. Um, and that course and her work, uh, really, uh, you know, moved me to look at myself. And that was really where the, the tough stuff had to start, right? What did it mean to be white? Um, you know, what were the unearned advantages that I had in my life because of that whiteness? How had I unintentionally hurt people around me without even realizing? It? And there's the pain and the shame that gets kicked mm-hmm. up with that too, um, which I think as horse lovers, we can also relate to the way that we engage with our horses. So, um, yeah, that and that was the start of what I believe is a lifelong journey, never ending, <laughs> never ending journey um, of of really figuring out how to be accountable um, for a system that I was born into. I didn't ask for the system, but I'm certainly in it and I benefit from it. Um, so. All that to say, I ended up in a a master's of education, uh, social justice education, and I was simultaneously thinking about going into doing horses professionally and doing dressage uh, riding. I had um, worked at a classical dressage barn in Spain and um, worked with one of the few women who had graduated from um, the Royal Spanish Riding School in Jerez. And... um, did some clinics with, um, Rafael Soto, who's an Olympic medalist. Um, and I was like, Oh, I want to do this. But it was like the, the injustice, even within the hierarchies of, of the, uh, horse industry were (laughs) just like, I'm like, how do I, how do I hold these contradictions at the same time? And, and it ended up working with a wonderful woman in Vermont for a while, um, who was doing, um, some Grand Prix, um, and, and even so it was like the hierarchy of the uh, horse industry was troubling. And then the way that I was engaging with horses was troubling. So I went to a professor and I said, how do I do both of these things? How do I commit myself to social justice? And how do I also show up at the barn, which feels like it, it was feeling like a world away. And I don't mean that pejoratively. It was just, it felt like I was, um, leaving a part of myself behind. Um, and at the time my professor said, you know, none of us are perfect and we show up how we show up and hold both of the things at the same time. I'm like, Oh, that's so hard. How do I, how do I do that? So, um, fast forward many, many years. Um, I am now a a clinical social worker, um, who incorporated horses into human treatment for about two years. And I think that's when things started to really feel like I needed to to make a shift, um, and that I couldn't show up one way um, in one setting and show up in another way in another setting. That it just it was it just felt really misaligned. So um, it is scary, vulnerable work. <laughs> um, I'm not gonna lie, uh, but uh, it feels really um, necessary. So um, I haven't practiced equine assisted psychotherapy in about a year because of COVID, um, but it's also given me a chance to, to, to write and to think about how I want to be in these spaces. So um, that is the short version of my, my journey. And I realized that wasn't short. So 
Yeah. Oh, it was perfect. It was perfect. And, and it makes me very excited um, to know someone who is uh, exploring the intersection of these spaces, um, you know, because I know for myself, the, the work around, um, you know, uh, yeah, like the systemic stuff that's going on, that's been very new. Like, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm really, uh, I guess the, it's, it's naming the shame of like, that's only a few years where I've seen myself as like, oh, like, I am racist mm -hmm. and I have, and that, and not out of being a bad person, but literally just because of the systems that I have been born into. And, and like you say, the privilege that I've been born into. Yeah. Um, and so it's, yeah, it's really, um, it just, it just like gets my blood running to know that, that you're um, deeply, looking at at this intersection right now and I've read a few more of your articles like as I as I saw this article and then I kind of started um down the rabbit hole <laughs> of your beautiful blog which everyone I would recommend going to look at um and read I I you know I found I you know these like I I was just hit by aha after aha after aha uh -huh. you know, it was, it was like the work, you know, the writing you were doing was naming these spaces inside myself, which I, I hadn't quite gotten to the point of being able to articulate, you know, my experience in them. And I think that is a, a part of the power of, of what I saw there is, is, you know, I think that's where many of us are drifting and, and sort of in this limbo space right now of like, okay, I see that things aren't, you know, this, this facade is falling away mm -hmm. and things aren't quite right, but like, what the heck, like, what do we do? What do we do with that? You know? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I'm, I'm just uh, humbled that, that you found something in that my writing that helped f make sense of all of the stuff that's going on. And I, and I will say that it has been um, I've been working with a dear friend and mentor of mine, um, Leif Helberg, and, you know, she and I have gone back and forth so many times about how to, how to articulate this, how to put it on paper. And it's like, you know, it was a, it was a labor process. It was a labor of, it. of, of love really. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, love is what drives uh, this and love, not in a, um, you know, soft, like Pollyanna love, like love and a fierce, like this is neat that we have to do something about this because the barn and m m much of the world is, is going up in flame and it's not okay. And so with love and with compassion, how do we, how do we look at ourselves? Mm. Yeah. Mm. yeah. There was one quote from one of your articles, which I'd shared with you, it really touched me, moved me. Um, that was, there can be no love without justice and the heart of justice is truth telling, seeing the world as it is, not as we want it to be. Mm. And I was like, Whew. yeah, that really landed in me for the, the journey that I'm on and the one that I see so many um, yeah. moving within at this moment on, in varying ways. Mm. Um, can you can you share a little bit more about, about that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, um, I think that this idea of love, um, I want to name really that quote comes from bell hooks and bell hooks, um, is a, a black woman, um, activist professor, um, kind of cultural critic. Uh, and she has a book called all about love and it is just, like feeds my soul. <laughs> um, and, um, it has, I, I read it for the first time, maybe a year and a half ago. Um, and it, it, I had been familiar with her work and I hadn't read that one, but the idea that to love or in order to love, we, we make a conscious choice, right? So much of, of patriarchy, I think. And, and this is, a, a lot of her um, idea is that patriarchy creates this, this idea of love that um, 
it just kind of happens. It's beyond our control. We fall. We, we you know, it, it is outside of us. And, and what Bell Hooks does, I think, is says, no, <laughs> we are, we choose to love. Love is, is, is an act. It is a conscious act that we do when we choose to see another uh, in the reality of their lived experience and to choose to see ourselves in the reality of our lived experience. And so by doing that, uh, making that conscious choice, um, one of the things that Bell Hooks talks about is that love and abuse cannot coexist at the same time. And I think that that justice is the absence of, of abuse. And so, um, you know, she does this so beautifully and really talks about the the early wounds that um, men have, which I alluded to in the in the article, um, and the wounds that women have because of the system. And she does a really beautiful job of um, naming white supremacy, patriarchy, and capitalism as like this interlocking. Thing that you, it's very hard to tease apart and that does us all some significant damage. So um, yeah, lo- love being a choice, um, seeing each other in the reality of our lived experience. I think those are the two really big takeaways um, from, from that uh, book and from her work. There's another um, uh, scholar that I followed and did my thesis research off of when I was an undergrad and his name is um, Eduardo Bonilla Silva and he's a sociologist at, at Duke um, and he has a book titled Racism Without Racists and it's a it's a oh it's a wonderful book um, but he, it's about colorblind racism and there's a a way in which this is um, kind of how I grew up in, in a, in a family. I love my family. Um, and they're wonderful and they're also part of this system, right? A system that can, um, really espouse a lot of liberal ideology, um, that actually, uh, doesn't, doesn't do anything to change, um, uh, injustice, right? It, it maintains status quo. So, one of the things that is really connecting between the work of Bell Hooks and Eduardo Bonilla Silva is this idea that often I know my family did, and I'm going to really try to speak from my own experience. I sometimes don't do that. Um, so uh, from my family and, and myself growing up, it was really common to say, um, you know, things should be equal. And so then therefore they are, or, you know, we, we should just treat people as, as people. And so, you know, policies like affirmative action, for example, are, are not okay. Um, there's a big leap between the, uh, um, this is how I see the world. So this is how things are, but there's this big gap in between. It's like, well, wait a second, <laughs> things might not actually be that way. And I think it takes an enormous amount of love and courage to say, um, let me look at that gap. Let me look at myself. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yes. I see that. And, you know, I, having, you know, my background is, is interesting too, in that I did, you know, the equine facilitated learning and then I did the healing work and then I did, you know, like we, we sort of find cobble our way together to, to where we are. And one of the things I teach about a lot, and I know that you speak to a lot, is this idea around congruence and incongruence and this concept of, you know, I always took it as do my insides match my outsides, you know, like am Mm -hmm. I, and and from the space of, oh, like are my emotions on the inside what I'm portraying on the outside, you know, but I, I, I was really, um, yeah, I was, I was very, very. Um, moved by the way that you took that and uh, like steps further because I think that it's so easy to kind of stop there in this Mm -hmm. understanding of congruence and be like okay like I you know I've got it sorted um but if we're not really being real with ourselves in in some very big ways um you know then then we are we are missing the mark like you know that's that's what I'm kind of seeing for myself is like I went through life thinking it was this way and it was actually something completely different 
Yeah. Like now that I'm taking the blinders off, I'm like, oh my gosh. And it's like some part of me knew yeah. that. It's like some part of me knew that things were not fair yeah. and, and that people were suffering because of that. Mm-hmm. But, um, and that was an incongruence in me that I wasn't even aware of, sure. you know, until I was, right? Mm-hmm. So so we talk about this idea of, you know, horses and congruence. And and I would love for you to share a little bit about, you know, where where you're going with that. Because I think it's really taking it beyond kind of this, this more simplified understanding mm-hmm. that we've been talking about for a long time. Yeah. Oh gosh, such a good question. And I, I, uh, I know for me, a lot gets kicked up around this idea of congruence and incongruence with horses. Like it's a place that you can just arrive at. And I, and I'm not sure if for me that feels true. I think it's a place that we just constantly strive for. Um, you know, I think healing incongruence is, um, in this context, the way that my, like the lens that I'm looking at is really about naming power. And I think that that has been something that I've seen that's been missing in, in the conversations. And so if we were to take one of the things I look at is, is the, the machinery of oppression, you know, the, the kind of, and this is borrowing from, um, Iris Young's work, um, but she she talks about five faces of oppression, five things we need. Um, you only need one of them for it to be oppression, but you can also have all five. Um, so what I have done is I've taken three. And this incongruence piece is so fundamental to sustaining oppression. It, 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 is, it is the ability to define reality. It's the bil- ability to take reality and um, and basically change it. It's like gaslighting on steroids. And so this is why colorblind racism, for example, is so damaging, right? It's it's um, W. E. Du Bois talked about this idea of double consciousness for for people of color. Um, and I mean the 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 sense of of knowing uh, your reality. And I think women can relate to this too, especially um, women that have had um, any sort of trauma, uh, taking your experience and then having somebody try to talk you out of it and convince you that it's not mm-hmm. real. Right. So this incongruence is in service to power, I, I believe. And, and so we really have to get, I think, clear and humble about the power that we have in, in relationship um, and, and to, to be mindful of naming that, um, you know, I think that, um, power is a tricky thing because it shows up differently depending on our, um, our different identities. And so if, you know, me, me as a, as a white woman moving through the world, I, I know that my whiteness, um, is is power is unearned power that I have that's going to impact all of my relationships not just with people but also my relationships with non-human animals my experience as a woman you know moving through the world that's going to show up in my relationships um you know I think that when we uh have this uh incongruence in our thoughts and in our actions or in that like little spidey sense that something is off, but that, you know, the practice of systemic oppression is to ignore that voice and to find reasons why, uh, you know, the reality we're claiming is right. And this is where labeling shows up as a, um, uh, a supportive feature of systemic oppression. So if we can label the other, um, we can bolster our definition of reality. Um, it's 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 a kind of a, a, a cluster. <laughs> it's it is. you know, and and it's um, it's it's messy, and and it's 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 also kind of scary. It's scary how easily um, we can shift the um, perception and the conversation. And so, I think. I think healing this is about 
Uh, it's about curiosity. I think it's about it's about developing the tolerance, which I think requires self love and self compassion to say, you know, uh, I've got some things I have to unpack here. How is my power showing up in this relationship? I may have not asked for this, but I have it. And so, what do I do? What do I do with it? I, I think conversations about incongruence without naming power are going to be in just incomplete. Mm. Oh, yeah. And I can see, you know, when you when you speak to all of that, it's like it 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 becomes impossible, or not impossible, but hard to 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 like tease out, you know. Um, yeah, like our relationships with our horses and our relationships with our neighbors and our relationships with our, you know, like other people in our, in our community, um, whatever it is, right? Like there is this sense of, um, yeah, when we sit back into, I I had one person, you know, and I'm sure you've heard this a million times, but this sense of like how we do one thing is how we do everything. Mm. You know, it's sort of like, we can't Mm -hmm. like trying to kind of go, okay, well, I'm going to do horses like this, but I'm going to do like the rest of my life like this. Like, Mm -hmm. I don't don't know (laughs) because you know, what we're, what we're demonstrating is like, you know, what we, what is within us, whether it's unconscious or conscious. Absolutely. Yeah. And this is a, this is a tricky thing. And, you know, I, I want to name that, um, you know, we have not, uh, we have not come far enough. I don't think in, in our culture where we are honoring and, and knowing the harm that our society, um, commits against, people of color against women, against queer people, against trans people, you know, it, it is just, it's so systemic. And so um, I want to be really mindful about how we are naming comparison. Um, and in fact, I almost don't, um, don't want to enter into a conversation about comparative suffering, um, you know, because I think what we're looking at here is how systems of oppression um, reproduce themselves in all, in all situations. Right. Um, I think we have a really, really long way to go um, before we uh, are, I don't know, um, at the, at the point where as a society, we can take accountability for the damage that we've done and I think it can be really painful, um, you know, for marginalized folks to hear um, the awareness around the injustice done to animals and not the awareness of injustice mm-hmm. done to people. And so I think we really need to enter into that conversation with a lot of grace and a lot of love um, and really name that that hasn't been done to the extent that it needs to be done. Um, I have this belief that we are deeply interconnected and that our kind of survival as a species on the planet, like depends on us seeing ourselves in another. Um, thank you, Rocky. Um, and so I, I think that my hope is that this understanding of how the mechanics of oppression work, uh, will be an invitation for, um, our horse community to really look at how it shows up with people um, mm-hmm. and in their relationships with horses. I mean, it, it is, you know, it's strategic on my, on my part. I'm like, I want everyone to be talking about systemic oppression, but not at the expense of anyone. So that feels really important to name. Yes, I, I very much appreciate that. And I know myself to be, you know, um, and I think this is, a part of the the fear for a lot of people is because there's newness to this and there's a lot of unknown. The territory feels very like, um, like, Oh, you know, am I going to step in a minefield? Am I going to do something, you know, say something wrong or like, you know, um, yeah, I think I, I, from the reading that I've done and, 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 and sort of the people, that I've chatted with, this can be a big, big piece, right? Of, okay, like we're going to potentially make mistakes and it's going to suck. And like, 
there is potential harm that can come out of that. Um, and it's that hard place of like, okay, do I keep having the hard conversations anyways? Yeah, absolutely. And I think it, I think, yeah, I think the answer is yes. And I know it's just, this is something that, that I can share just my personal journey around is that it, I I ask my therapist this often. I'm like, when is this work not going to feel scary and uncomfortable? And the the conclusion is that it's always going to feel scary and uncomfortable. And it's, you know, it's building the tolerance and the people in your community that are going to be there with you when you do make mistakes. And when you do say something that's hurtful, I think the fear is, um, at least for me, the fear has been having my racism or my internalized sexism or my internalized homophobia, all of those things, having them exposed and meaning that that means I'm bad in some way. And the reality is, is that the system is bad. The system is, is not good, but we are not bad. And so how do we create resilience, um, especially for those of us who walk through the world with multiple privileged identities, how do we create the community in order to build resilience, to have the conversations that are scary? Um, You know, I think I spent a lot of work working specifically with white people around the fear of having the conversations. And I think one of the things that I see a lack of is community, um, is holding because Oftentimes um, in my work, uh, I I see many white people operating from shame. And one of the um, armors to shame is to shame others, right? And uh, I do a lot of Brene Brown work with folks Mm -hmm. um, and trained in her curriculum and um, really kind of figuring out how do we get rid of that armor and and build up healthier, (laughs) different armor so that we can really hold each other because this is hard work and we can't do it alone. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. (laughs) (sighs) Breathing out. Um, And uh, yeah, and it's, it's, uh, I mean, I've been having, and as I was sharing before the podcast, I've been having kind of my own little mini eye-opening experience here on my property around, around, the use of power and, and oppression of a different type. And, um, it's been really like, yeah. it's kind of a next level, you know, it's kind of a like, Oh, like recognizing in real time, um, that the systems that are in place that I had hoped would sort of come through like a hero in the night, you know, like, and for those that don't know what's been going on here, my I have a new neighbor. My new neighbor has deemed it necessary to take down every single tree on his 12-acre property mm-hmm. within the last three weeks. So, so close to 500 trees that have come down. And, and I'm talking like northwest rainforest, firs, pines, yeah. you know, 50 years old, freaking tragic stuff. Nice. Um, but when I called in to the municipality and to my MLA and to like these governing bodies, I was told over and over and over again, there's nothing we can do. The regulation that is in place has, has no, there is nothing, no red tape, not a single bit of, of, you know, anything that needs to be done for this to happen. And I was like, it was, it was, you know, it was such an eye opener. And then, and then to, you know, message a friend of mine who I knew was involved in, you know, some pieces, like some some projects and stuff around preserving land in this valley. And um, and he's an indigenous man. Mm-hmm. And he just said, yeah, so, uh, yeah, this has been happening forever. And this is why we have 1% of our old growth left. And, you know, he kind of just went, oh, the white girl finally understood what is happening here. Right. Like, and I, I went, Oh my gosh, how was my head under such a rock? Like Mm -hmm. to not recognize that this, this is happening all around me. And I just didn't, you know, I didn't see it. And as a tenant here on this land, recognizing, Oh, like, I don't, I don't have power here. Mm -hmm. Like in Mm -hmm. this scenario and, and, and also, okay, what are some of the choices that I can make? So it's been like this really fascinating experience here 
to to come up front and center to some of the realities of this kind of power right um and 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 the sense that people don't see the harm yeah well as you're as you're naming that i'm just feeling the grief that comes with the the seeing right the grief that we have to hold with seeing the grief that you know folks in marginalized communities have to hold all the time and and that grief i think can feel really debilitating and very overwhelming and this is why we need community this is why oh, we yeah. need uh each other we cannot do this alone you know that that grief um I think also shows up in our relationship with horses as we start to see them differently. And we, um, uh, a friend uh, and mentor of mine, um, her, her name is Adele Shaw. She's fantastic. If you haven't checked her out, check her out. <laughs> um, she uh, posted something the other day and it was just like, you know, we have to give ourselves some grace in the process of, of unlearning what we've learned. And, and that is true for all systems, there is a, a deep unearthing <laughs> that we need to go through that is incredibly painful. And this is where we need to draw our, our, our community close um, and, and go through that grieving process so then we can show up um, for each other uh, and for our, our horses and our other non-human animal companions. But that that grief, I think, can really um, knock us off our feet mm -hmm. um, and lead us down into shame, right? That that interaction that you're having with your friend who is indigenous and saying, yeah, of course, it's always been this way. <laughs> and, and then you have this, oh, crap, <laughs> you know, <laughs> wake up moment. You know, my work is around uh, because I, I've, I've been through all of the different places in shame. I know them so well. <laughs> um, is helping people to have resilience around that so they can stay in the work, so they can stay in the, this is not okay, I want to change it. When we move into shame, you know, we become uh, frozen, right? Mm -hmm. We become frozen, we become stuck, we become so hard on ourselves for not seeing um not seeing a system that really in a lot of ways wants to, wants to remain um, hidden to the people that have the power. So yeah, that shame work I think is same resilience is so important and the self-compassion. So I'm a big fan of, of Brene Brown and, and Kristen. Oh, yeah. And I do a lot of that uh, when I'm feeling the, the nervous system and um, you know, because I make mistakes all the time. It's just part of being human and showing yeah, up. Yeah, it's the humanness. And yeah, there was there was one particular piece of one of the articles you wrote, um, Julia, that, that um, yeah, again, I, I just really found myself drawn into this. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Like, um, so it was, you said, our congruence in our interactions with horses in treatment rests at our fingertips that grip swinging lead ropes and whips as we talk about choice and consent. It sits as confusion in our gut as we close the round pen gate as our horse calls for its herd. It gets performed as our power to name our reality as the reality. It gets swallowed as the questions we are afraid to ask. In the end, both the old school and natural approaches to engaging with horses are marked by power and control. Although the methods have changed, the thoughts and core beliefs that support these methods have not. Namely, that we are right and justified in what we do, and the horse will, meet, will need to meet us in the place of our answer. We want clients to develop healing relationships. How can that be done in the context of controlling another? Mm. Yeah. Mm. I mean, I, I think many of us, for many of mm. us, these are questions like, like you said, that get swallowed because maybe we don't know, like, what what are the next steps? Like, what where do we go from here? You know. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. We'd love to to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah. You know, I think that. Um, one of the one of the the 
I don't know what it, I even want to call it. One of the pieces of systemic oppression that um, is very real is is the way that we police each other, right? So um, I, I find the examples easiest when it comes to men. Men um, are so damaged by systemic oppression. Um, and the narrative, I think, um, might be that they they really benefit. And they do. They have a lot of unearned unearned power, but the cost is so great. Um, there's actually a quote. I want to pull it up. Let's see if I can find it. Um, it's a, it's a bell hooks quote. And I just, um, I just love it. And I think that it's, um, gosh, let's see if I'm going to be able to actually, okay. Well, you know what I did is I like put so many quotes here that <laughs> I probably won't be able to find it. But the reality of what uh, Bell Hooks names and a lot of people name is that, you know, you know, men uh, learn very early on that they are, are only allowed to have certain certain feelings and are, are only allowed to operate within their body to an, a certain extent. So, um, you know, I think that... Um, Moving forward, there is there needs to be a recognition of the harm done by these systems of how every single one of us has um, has been hurt by a system that asks us to uh, have power over. Um, I, I'm a firm believer that that irresponsible power over is, is always going to erode parts of ourselves. Um, and so policing, I think, is, is, is part of the reason why many people don't, don't um, move faster or move quicker, because we're very um, skilled, un- unknowingly, of putting people back in their place. And so there's a lot of language that we use to, to keep people from um, resisting these the systems. And I think some of this is unconscious. It's just pr- it's practiced within the culture. And so I think we want to really first name what are the mechanisms that, that we might be using to police each other to um, keep the system the same, right, to, to prevent things from, from moving forward. Um, you know, I will admit that I am a huge fan of positive reinforcement uh, after being mm-hmm. in horses. Me for, too. Yeah, for like, you know, 20 plus years, I've heard everything, uh, uh, all the reasons why not to do it. Um, and I can't help but see the parallels between the way that colorblind racial ideology works, right? We have very practiced, very nuanced kind of cul-de-sacs. This is what Eduardo Bonilla Silva talks about is how we interpret information becomes very predictable. And so, um, after by maybe seven years of, toying with this idea of positive reinforcement, I started to hear these very predictable routes of resisting um, this different way, this force-free way of, of engaging. And, and, you know, the, the parallels are not lost on me. I'm like, wait a second, like part of our way, I think that of, of moving forward is saying, are these explanations in the service of our power? Are they in the service of creating a deeper relationship with with each other or with our non-human animal companions? And if it's in the service of our power, then we really need to take a step back and say, okay, deep breath. (laughs) What am I afraid of? Right. Mm -hmm. What am I afraid of losing? Um, And then, you know, this is a conversation for another time, but this is when when we get into reenactments. This is when we get into trauma reenactments. Um, and so I think the other piece of, of recognizing this incongruence is doing our own deep work, doing our own deep healing work, you know, seeking out a therapist, trying to unearth how this system has hurt all of us um, and how we can be a, a aware enough of the thoughts and the actions that go on so that we can start to start to change it. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. Does that answer your question? I, I that does. Know. Yeah, in a lot of ways. And I, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I, I I'm going to be writing an article upcoming about the, 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 the blessing and the curse of traditions, shall wow. we call it, um, within within horses yeah. um, specifically. But you know, obviously, 
related to to other things in the way that we are as humans. And I, I know for myself in my work, so often one of the big fears that comes up for my clients is this fear of unfamiliarity or the unknown or, you know, things that we like don't have a handle on, right? Like, and that fear of letting go of control or being out of control. Those are huge pieces. And I noticed actually, like, it's so funny you bring up the positive reinforcement because I've had my mayor, we've been together for like 17 years, like a really long time. Yeah. And I have had my new mayor in my life for about a year. And I started doing positive reinforcement training with her because I learned it, you know, through various guests and like, you know, it just come into my world in all these different ways. And I was like, okay. And I was doing it with Raven. But weirdly enough, like I just wouldn't do it with Diva. Like I, you know, I was I was like, well, you know, something in me was oh, like, yeah. no, 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 no. She's gonna get too excited about the treats, or like there was just all these pieces yeah. that came into my mind about like why this wouldn't work. Right. And then one day I have I have a, a um a, a mom and her son that come up and work with my girls. And I was like, we're gonna try target training, like, because you know, it's something new and different. And Diva was a superstar at it. Like she just oh. absolutely loved it. You know, yeah. she's tw- almost 22 and she's like, this is amazing. I get <laughs> treats. I just get to touch this thing. I get treats. Like, you know, yeah. just, it, I could see her so enthused. And I sat with this, like, why haven't I done it yet? Oh. Like, why, what is it in me that's like, no, that <laughs> won't work. Like, <laughs> you know, like. And just watching her going, oh my God, she loves this stuff. She's so stoked. Um, and and it was just a, a real wake up call of like the the ways that these sort of traditions or the way that I've always done it and it's good enough and it works just fine. And I don't, or don't broke, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Like that sort of, you know, narrative was playing in my mind around something that, you know, is actually super beneficial yeah. for, for, for my horse, you know, and me, you know, oh so it's just, it was really, really eye opening oh, to I can me. Totally relate to that. I have a, <laughs> I have a, 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 no, a very old dog and a younger dog. And my relationship with my old dog is complicated because we've gone through all of the different ways of training, you know, and I made so many mistakes with him. Um, and I feel within myself that was the same resistance. And, you know, I think it is, it is naming it, right? It, it is the, that's the first piece, at least I think it's just, you know, having that ability, it's vulnerable to say, I have resistance around doing this thing because what I, all the different things, maybe I'm afraid that it'll be harder. Maybe it'll take more time. Maybe I'm, I am, there's some control I'm going to lose. I mean, as a therapist, I'm like, all of those reasons feel valid. And so we have to honor them in order to mm-hmm. move forward. Right. And, yeah. you know, yeah. it, it is, I have been struck. Um, control is something that, oh my gosh, I can, <laughs> I could speak another hour about that. Um, but, you know, but as a, as a woman who, who has experienced trauma in, in my life, control has been one of those things where it's like, I want to hang on to it, you know, I want to mm-hmm. rip it really tight. And there has always been a, a part, at least in, in, in the early years of writing that has given me that sense of control. And, and now I am um, asking myself a different question, not uh, what can I control, but what helps me feel grounded? Mm. Right? Not what I can have control over, right? But uh, maybe shifting it to a more feminist lens of I don't need to have control over anything except for myself, right? I can, I can find things that help me to feel more grounded in who I am. And that mm. is, it is a is a real learning curve. It's a real healing process. Um, yeah. But I think it prepares us to have those same paradigm shifts when it comes to our human relationships, which has to happen. I think if we really want to heal, um, the horse industry. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think about, I think about my own self-work and I think about when I am the most controlling. Mm. 
And it is when I am most stressed, like oh. by far. And I just become like, you know, everything, like every little thing. I just want to nitpick and, you know, um, like I'm annoying to myself. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> just like, oh my gosh. Um, and I love that piece where you, you're just saying, yeah, like that's when you ground, that's when you breathe. That's when you, you know, for me, dance or, you know, I, I, I see often what happens with people and horses, particularly in like sort of negative reinforcement spaces, yeah. is when they lose control, the stress levels go up oh and then they try to get more control, right? Yeah. And then we get like escalation and then we get trauma and then we get right? Like yes. we get disasters and accidents and right. Rather than I think it's been such a challenge. So many people have this belief perpetuated from early days of if you give an inch, they'll take a mile. Yeah. If you give an inch, they'll take a mile. So there's this such, a, like I even know for myself, stepping back when I'm, when the fight's coming and I'm like, you know, I got to be right. Yeah. Stepping back is very challenging. Mm, totally. Right. And, and, and just going, okay, what do, what is actually needed here? Like maybe I just need to, to walk away, take a breath, yeah. find myself, de-escalate, mm -hmm. come back to the table. Right. Oh, but it's hard. Yes, absolutely. I resonate with all of that. And it is very hard. That that escalation, I think, is the trauma reenactment, yeah. right? It is the, I need to maintain the power over. And even the phrase, you know, I love history. I want to put us all always into context. You know, uh, you know, if you give an inch, they'll take a mile. I'm, I'm thinking about all the context that has been said in, especially in our human to human history, right? How are we repeating and repeating and repeating? Um, and I still don't have the answers to what happens to kind of like our neurobiology when we are one way with, you know, one being and one way with another being. I, I just, I'm not sure if it's possible. I think that, I don't know, for me, I'm trying to find that place of alignment where we can, stop the, the that trauma reenactment but it is a letting go of of power and you know it's complicated because in our relationships with horses that power is always going to be there right we're always going to have a power over because of the nature of domestication and so how do we name it and then figure out how to move within it Right. It's it's not about uh, I, for me, at least it's not about saying, OK, well, I no longer have power. I mean, I clearly do my horses. You know, she's in a, a fenced in area. She can only go so far. I, t I tell her who she's friends with. I give her her food. She didn't choose to be in a relationship with me. So I want to be really clear about my power. And then I'm going to do everything that I can do to give her more autonomy and choice in her life. Mm. But it is, that's just, this is, this is the healing, right? This is the struggle. Um, oh, and, and yeah. I think coming back to ourselves. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, and uh, I mean, I have, I have tears in my eyes with that, you know, because I, I think uh, that's a part of that incongruence piece, right? Is we just don't want to see. Yeah we don't want to see that power over, you know, especially yeah. for those of us that love horses and feel this connection and, and this sure. depth in that relationship. Yeah. But at the end of the day, like you're right. You know, my, my horses are, have a fenced in area. They, you know, they're on my schedule, mm -hmm. right. They, you know, yeah, I determine, I yeah. determine their life and that's, that is, wow, that is a lot of power. And I think, I guess what I'm hearing is it's important. It's incredibly important how we wield that power. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And that's where we, I really believe, do that healing work. Um, 
and I think everyone's journey is going to be different around what mm-hmm. that looks like for them. But naming it is, I think, th- it's such an important step. And this is where we get into the incongruence, I think, when we have this language that um, is maybe not quite aligned. You know, we talk about partnership and we talk about choice and we talk about consent. We really need to be careful about when and how, at least I believe, you know, I'm not going to call my Philly a partner right now. She, she is, she's not choosing. I show up at the barn and I'm like, okay, I, I'm making this as reinforcing as possible for you. Um, but because there's not necessarily, I mean, she can walk away and I, and I do give her that choice, but I just want to be really mindful of like, okay, how do I name my power in this, in these moments? Um, and how do I try to give some of it back? I'm not I'm never going to be able to give all of it back in, in my relationship with her, but I can at least try. I, I want to name something really quick, which I, it's a story. It's very quick. It's something mm-hmm. that really brings kind of just like a smile to my face. Um, I took a class with Susan Friedman, um, who I deeply respect. Um, and she uh, really does a lot of work in, in ethics, I think, around um, learning. And how do we create a, a learning environment for um our learners, which are our horses, right? Or maybe if you're a teacher, it's your students, but we're always learning. And uh, she shared this story of these uh, frogs, these beautiful frogs in Disney. And there was this problem where the the care care, um, folks would come in and try to take care of them, but they were worried about stepping on them. And so um, they developed this plan where they would teach the frogs to go into these little containers every time the door opened. And so by the time this plan was done, the care keepers would open the door to take care of these frogs and every frog would go in their container. And I'm just like, magic, magic. There's no reason why we need to wield irresponsible power over the horses that we love when we can teach these beautiful tree frogs to go into these little containers without even touching them. I, I find it so beautiful. And, um, you know, it, 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 that, that stories like that really guide me. I think when I'm struggling, um, is that we can do so much with kindness, um, uh, maybe even more than we know. And I kind of hold on to that, especially when I'm having a hard, a hard time when that power over peace comes up for me really strongly. So mm, that's really beautiful. And yeah, I think I, I I love this idea of, you know, thinking about learning and adaptation when we work with our horses, healthy learning, healthy adaptation. And, and uh, when we're um, in relationship, you know, what, what are ways to amplify that in a good way, you know, and, um, and that, you know, not from a place of like them, you know, learning quote unquote, because they're afraid they're going to be punished or something bad's going to happen or, or whatnot. And, you know, I think, um, I see, I see so much hope for, for the horse industry, at least in my little pocket of it. I, I, I have, and I, I know that I'm, I'm totally biased because of the community that I'm surrounded by and, you know, like the people that, that, um, listen to this podcast and, you know, reach out to me and, and I work with, uh, but I, I, I've just maintained this glimmer of hope of, you know, people that are trying something different, you know, yeah. Yeah. And and I think it comes back to that love piece. It's like, how do we show our love? That's you know. That's right. Yeah. yeah. I share your hope. I, I really do. And I wouldn't be doing this work if I didn't. And yes, can we come back to love? And and what is love? Love what is, is love. Seeing, really truly seeing each other and seeing ourselves. And and that sometimes requires um you know, deep, deep grief, um, deep holding of each other, um, community, all of, all of the things that I think, uh, systemic oppression, uh, kind of t- takes from us or, or robs us of it, it, you know, it's a, and I know you do a lot of bo- embodied work. It's, it's about mm-hmm. coming back into your body. And so it's like, 
oh my gosh, I'm just, um, I'm excited to hear about all of the incredible work that I, that I hear people doing and we need everyone, um, doing the things that they're doing to be able to make these, these changes. Mm. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. I can feel that web and it's very, yeah, it feels really, really, you know, um, yeah, there's just this this little flicker in me of like, oh, you know, and now being able to connect with 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 the internet and with in these ways, you know, <laughs> have these conversations. Oh, no. Um it's a real it's 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 quite it's quite a time that we're in at the moment and I do look forward to you know your all your work coming up and I hope you keep writing. I really oh, hope you keep writing. You. <laughs> It takes so long for me. I, I am a recovering perfectionist. So I'm oh, like, me too. Yeah. yeah. Totally. We have that in common. So, you know, um, sometimes it is a, a painfully scary process to just put something out there. Um, I would be so curious, you know, I'm not always certain about what people are wanting. Um, if any of your listeners have any feedback or mm. um, feel like they need certain things, um, I'm at kind of a precipice right now where I'm, I'm trying to decide what direction to go in, straddling all these different areas. So totally. um, I'm always open to input and, and feedback. Awesome. Yeah. Well, tell, let's, uh, let's get into it. Tell my listeners how they can find your amazing website and blog. Yeah. So um, I'm at uh, juliaalexandercounseling.com. Um, and then my email um, contact information is all on there. Um, the website is in the, in the works and constantly <laughs> changing. So um, I try to tone down that perfectionism. Um, but I would love to hear from people and um, you know, really want to kind of get input on what what direction do I go in next? Uh, So if any of your listeners have any feedback, then feel free to reach out. Amazing. I, I, I'm going to just put a hint out there. A book sounds very good if you're ever up for it. <laughs> yes. Well, that sounds awfully scary. But, um, maybe a co-written uh, book. I yeah. Collaborating. Right? So anyone else totally. out there that wants to. <laughs> um, yeah. Awesome. Oh, it's been a real, real honor and pleasure to speak with you today, Julia. Same. Oh, really feeling um, a lot with that conversation. I'm sure that others might be as well. And yeah, um, yeah. and we are both here, Julia and I, if you've got questions or or things that have come up for you um, with this episode. And um, if you go to wholehorse.ca, you'll have her the link and also I'll pick through and, and find your, your resources that you shared yeah. through the podcast as well. And I'll have links there for that. So you can go to wholehorse.ca and I think it's episode 74, 75, mm-hmm. this one. So uh, check it out there. Thank you everyone so much for tuning in today and being with us on this journey and through this conversation. And um, yeah, very appreciated, Julia, for your time today. Oh, thank you so much. Wonderful. Okay, everyone, we'll see you or hear from you very, very soon on our next episode. Thanks for listening. Hi, everyone, and thanks for listening today. I wanted to also thank you for your patience over the last few months. I'm in mid-studying for my finals for my osteopathy program, and I am very, very overtaken by that at the moment. So I promise I will be back with far more episodes after May 10th. (laughs) I've got a few coming up here, though, in the next little bit um, to keep the learning going here. And speaking of learning, Elise Miki and I have teamed up to create an equine cranial course. This course has both online and in-person components. And so no matter where you live, you can learn. If you're an equine therapist who's been curious and interested in adding cranial work to your practice with horses, this might be a great addition for you. You can learn more at alexalinton.com slash cranial therapy, and you can reach out to me if you have any questions, alexa at alexalinton.com. Looking forward to hearing from you and hope you're all doing great. Talk to you soon. Mm -hmm.